Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Melissa O'Neill from Harvey Mudd College, and I'm delighted to be here today to um, talk to you a little bit about the PCG family of random number generations, random number generators. So I'm going to begin with a question for you all. By the way, I like to have things be a little bit interactive. So I like to ask the people in the audience, put up your hand if you've ever written a program that used a random number generator. <laughs> so that's basically everyone in the room. Let me just for comparison, let's say, put up your hand if you've ever written a program in Haskell. Okay, <laughs> vastly fewer people, vastly fewer people have actually said that they, they and so we could argue, right, that this means that, that you are far more concerned about things like random number generation than you could possibly be about things like Haskell. And it is the case that random number generators are actually everywhere in computer science. They're used for cryptography, they're used, um, for simulation, they're used for games, they're used um, for optimization problems, they're used for all sorts of computational creativity. In fact, at Harvey Mudd College, we have a, a programming languages class and we have a random art assignment where it's, it's all about purportedly expression evaluation, but it actually produces cool art like that. So random numbers are everywhere in computer science and they've been there pretty much since the beginning. In fact, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the history of random number generation and ask you a question, which is, how did computers generate random numbers in 1927? And so some of you are probably thinking, hmm, that sounds a bit odd because I don't think there were computers in 1927. But there were, they just weren't machines. They were people like you, and and so and so yeah there were there were so here's here's an example I'm holding up a book here of um, something that was was called um, tracts for computers the series like for people who would do computation this is from 1927 it's by um, Tippett and inside is a nice collection of random numbers. This is how people would generate random numbers. And, and in fact, when this book came out, it received some criticism and people wrote some more papers saying, you know, these random numbers, not quite so good as you'd hope. And so um, Kendall, who produced the Kendall Tower thing in the, the mid thirties, he produced a much better book, part of the same Tracks for Computers series. And um, had this actually had 10,000 random digits in it. And the real sort of culmination of this, of this thing was this, this book by the Rand Corporation, which was called A Million Random Digits. And so this came out in 1955. And so I have a question for you, which is, you know, given this, um, this thing, does this does this make sense? Oh, well, I should point out that this, these, are, these are grouped in five, so we could also consider it a million digits or 200,000 five-digit numbers. Um, well, my question for you is, is twofold. One, how would you use a book like this? And two, does a book like this make any sense to you at all <laughs> as a concept? I mean, does it seem completely flawed? And I love people to be um, kind of um, contrarian, so I'd like you to sort of talk to somebody next to you. I'm not going to only give you like less than a minute probably, but I'd like you to confer with somebody near you, if possible, disagree with them. So um, take a second, confer with someone. Does this, does this concept of a book of random numbers make any sense at all? So talk to each other, see what you think. <laughs> you need a, you use one book to find a number. Okay, that's all the time you get, I'm afraid. So let me just ask, um, I'm going to ask first of all for somebody to have a criticism of this thing, somebody who thinks that the entire concept is, is, is flawed in some way. Anyone have a criticism? Well, it depends on how many random numbers you need. If you okay. only need one, any of those books is acceptable. <laughs> okay, so, so, so possibly if we need you know, more than 200,000 random numbers, that would, be, that would be a problem. So, so the size of the book might be an issue. Any, any other concerns? Uh, a book like that was extremely useful back then for making one-time codes. Okay, so we, could, so we could use it. Actually, that's a good question. Is it useful for, one, 
for one time codes or not. Um, yes. Your enemy has the same copy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, you know, the, this is the thing. Every one of these books has the exact same numbers in it. And so, um, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. If you actually search for this thing on Google, you get lots of hits for these numbers. If you start with these, start with numbers, put them into Google, you get a lot of, you get a whole bunch of, you get a whole bunch of hits. Also, by the way, this is actually on sale at Amazon. You can buy this at Amazon still. They put it out, uh, and the the reviews are just fascinating. They there's, there's actually somebody who said exactly what, what we we're just talking about, saying, you know, I I got one of these books, and then my confederate got this book. I was horrified to discover they had the exact same numbers. I'm, I'm sending mine back. And, and so it's got, got wonderful reviews on, on Amazon. Um, but can somebody make some lemonade about the fact, like we, 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 we said that maybe that's a problem, that these books have the, same, have the same numbers. Is there something positive that we can say about that? Yes. Well, this was done before the NSA, so we know there are no hidden patterns. <laughs> ah, yes. So this, this is a really, we can actually, there's a name for this. We can call this nothing up my sleeve numbers. The, the thing is, if, if you decide to use these numbers and, that, and you didn't make the book, you can absolutely claim there's nothing up your sleeve that, that they didn't just, you know, there's nothing, there's no trick. You know, if, if somebody else comes out with some numbers, oh, these are my random numbers, you can be like, oh, really? But these ones you can, you can maybe have a more confidence in. Well, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a good thing. We, we'll talk in a moment about whether or not, you know, how they, exactly how these were made and whether or not they... They kind of have any any pattern in them. Yes. Well, the, it's really useful about having multiple books with the same code. Is it gives you the exact same results that a single random number could generate. Right. So, so one of the things is that we get the if we use the same if we use the same starting point, right. and we can get reproducible results, which is actually a really useful thing. If if you produce some results and you say, oh, I just took some random numbers from somewhere, and and we can be like, really, really did you? And whereas if you say, well, I took them from this book, and if you want to replicate my results, you totally can. That repeatability is a wonderful thing. So that's a that's a really nice a really nice thing that we have reproducibility that we can reproduce the same the same results. These were generated from actual random stuff. I can actually show you. Uh, here's all the numbers at a glance, by the way. This is all 200,000 numbers as a, as a little graphic. Um, and so we can say that they look, they certainly look random. <laughs> that's a noise. So, so that's, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Were these uh, two, two successive numbers being XY coordinates, or which one? They, they will be fine. We'll come back, we'll come to that. Anyway. They, but these were generated, it's actually interesting. They, they, they used a technique that they called an electronic roulette wheel, which is trying to make it seem like it sounded sort of plausible to people. But, but they, um, they used that, and, and when they originally did it, they ran the machine, and the machine wasn't working quite right, and it produced this stuff that didn't look statistically random. So they cleaned all the little wheels and so forth on their, on their little gizmos, and eventually, eventually produced stuff that looked pretty good. Like at a glance, it looked pretty good. But even in 1955, people had developed tests when they were criticizing Tippett's book. Um, they develop tests like the poker test, which is like you kind of simulate doing hands of poker and see what the distribution of hands look like and so on. And when they did that, again, they found that things were actually kind of disappointing that if you, although you couldn't see it, there was sort of subtle things there that it really wasn't quite as random as people would have liked. And so the final thing, by this point in 1955, there were electronic computers. A lot of people at that time used to insist that you called them electronic computers to distinguish them from the other kind, the, the real computers. Um, but they put it, they actually put it through an algorithm to, um, to make it so that they, that scrambled it up and, and did make it finally sort of random enough to pass the statistical tests. And that's actually a thing that's often, like for, for most naturally derived randomness, people do need to put it through algorithms of some kind because actual natural randomness tends to have some kind of bias of some kind. And so it's not, it's not uncommon to, to have to do that. Um, Given that this was produced by a machine and, and scrambled up afterwards and, and, and so on, and it passed all these statistical tests, we could say it's statistically random. Does that mean that we can't possibly predict what's going to happen? Like if, if, I, if, I, if I start here and start reading off like 2, 3, um, 6, 1, 2, 5, et cetera, does that mean that no one could know where in the book I'm reading? Anyone think? So, no, we, could do, we, could just, we could just, even though these books have no clear pattern to them, we could just store the whole book and search through and find it. In fact, we could just store some, some kind of markers every so often, and that would work too. So it is reproducible, and, it's, and it's pretty, even though it was produced in a random way, it's predictable because we have the entire book, we could always search through the whole thing. 
One other thing is, even though it was statistically random, for this method of, which I think many of you came up with, I didn't ask you about it, but this method of saying, oh, I'll just pick, a, pick an arbitrary starting point and start reading off. If we do that, let me ask you a question about this. This did pass as a sort of a statistically random sample, but if I, if I pick a, a number here, what do you think the probability that I've picked a 2 should be? Should be 1 in 10, right? That's what we'd, that's what we'd hope. Um, but because this is a random sample of stuff from this machine, it's not quite 1 in 2. Uh, sorry, 1 in 10. It's, it's kind of a little bit off. In fact, we're 729s shy of the, the right number of 9s, and we've got 642 mini 2s. Now, as a random sample, that's sort of what, you'd, what, what is reasonable. But it is a bit unfortunate that this means that using this, this thing of picking arbitrary places in the book, it's going to be biased. It's going to be, it's going to be um, biased. It's even worse if we, if we go up to the, look at the five-digit numbers in the, in the book because, again, you'd hope that with, that with five digits, the odds would be 1 in 10 to the 5. That's what you'd hope. And so we'd average with 200,000 numbers, um, we'd average 2. And we do sort of average 2, but there are, four, there are twice as many five zeros and five nines never shows up at all. And so if you're hoping to, to randomly pick and get five nines someday, it's never going to happen with this book. So that's, that's a problem. By the way, if you love the number 66220, that's great. That shows up 12 times. So, um, so that's, that's great. But back in 1955, when they had this, they we already said that they, they put it through a computer. Um, and people were already doing fun things with computers. So you might say, well, why couldn't they have done done something different. So let's consider some other options they could have had besides using a machine, uh, besides using the, the hardware machine to do things. So here's one, one option that they could have done. They could have taken some, some digits from pi and said, well, let's, let's use those as my, as my random digits. Um, so there we've got our, our digits from pi. Over oh, some people looking a bit puzzled. So, anyway, so, so what was that? E. Oh, you think it's E. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't mention that this is the digits of pi starting at the one point something trillionth digit. Um, so, no, that wasn't E. That is actually digits from pi. Um, they're just further up. Uh, so, so, yes, that's, that is um, some digits from, from pi. And, of course, we could, we could, I could have picked some other starting point. These, these digits from pi... Um, look a bit like the golden ratio um, to those of you who love the golden, the golden ratio. By the way, um, what do you, how easy do you think it will be to find these, these digits in pi? Like, how easy do you think it is to, to, to find? Like, if I said those are the some digits from pi, how easy do you think that would be? N log n. So, n log n. So, assuming what? Like, assuming like that, we've, that we've stored it all or something? Yes. Like all infinitely many digits. <laughs> so, so, yeah, sure. so, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is with pi is it's a bit awkward because it does have sort of, it goes on forever. Um, but if we had a finite range, again, we could, we could store the, the thing. In fact, I, um, I downloaded, you know, the first, the first two trillion um, digits. And so all of the things I come, I, I do come from the first two trillion. Um, and so this actually comes from fairly early on, actually. But we, could, we didn't have to do pi. We could have picked any, any, any real number. That's like my favorite. Um, so um, any, any thoughts about this as a strategy? Uh, anything worse or better about this as a strategy compared to them using the machine they used for this book? Um, anyone have any, any thoughts about any, any thoughts about that? Like, what kind of machine did they use to make the book? So well, it was, it was some hardware, that, some electronics that produce random random stuff, so they claimed. What's proven about the statistics of the digits of pi? What's been proven about them? So the, the smart money um, and the math, like, it turns out that it's really, really hard to prove things about randomness, but the, the smart money is on, like, there's this property that, real, that, numbers, that real numbers have. Almost all real numbers are something called normal, which means that essentially that they look as if they're, they're completely random. And the smart money is that pi is is normal, although and everything everything that all the evidence points to that, but it has not been proved. But you know the same the same is true for lots of other things. Like so, it's empirically empir empirically it's as random as it gets, but um, it's not been 
it's not being proved. And it, so, but that's, that's a that's thing. We could also claim that pi is the ultimate nothing up my sleeve number. It's like this, we could, we could claim that, well, we trust these people at the Rand Corporation, they had nothing up, the, up their sleeve, but we can sort of trust that pi doesn't really have anything, anything up its sleeve. So, and based on what we just saw about, depending on where I pick, unless I've stored the whole thing, which starts to get impractical as we go more and more, it's not going to be easy to predict. So here's some positive things that we can say about pi. Statistically, the smart money is, is, is that it's random. It's an, it's an infinite stream. It's like it's never going to finish, which is, which is kind of wonderful. If I gave you some digits, you would have a hard time without just doing an exhaustive search to find where they came from. We can get reproducible results if we know where we're starting from. And it's the ultimate last thing up our sleeve number. So it's kind of surprising, perhaps, like, why doesn't everybody just use pi as a thing? Well, there's nothing up your sleeve. You're depending on somebody to do the work for you. Well, the thing is, we, we're depending on, on the sort of the nature of pi, but the, but the thing is, in the same way that we picked a random starting point, we can pick a random starting, we can pick an arbitrary, I mean, both of this book and, and pi, we're using this thing as sort of like, like as an amplifier for, our, for some initial, we could call it seed randomness, that we, we pick some starting point and then we read off random looking numbers from that, from that starting point. And so from that, from that point, um, it's, if we have an arbitrary starting point, it's, it's not going to be it's not going to be easy to to predict, which I think is. No, no. What I was trying to say is that the the guy who computed the digits of pi could mm -hmm. have had a bug in his software. Ah, well, we, we can we can compute it in a bunch of different ways. So that's that is that's an important thing. There are certain, and and in fact, for people to to produce digits of pi, there's a whole bunch of stuff about how you verify it and so on. So how do I pick the random starting point? Well, that's that's an interesting that's an interesting question, and it's something that was that is true for the book and true 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 for everything. What we can say is that the books and everything else they they are like an amplifier for some initial randomness. You could either always pick the same point if you want reproducible results, or you can pick something something cute like you know what day is it today? What's your you know and and maybe do some things with your friends, do whatever, take a take a photograph, take the MD five, check some of it, whatever you want to do to produce some initial non determinism. But the the key thing about all of these approaches, right from the, the earliest one, is, is they are randomness amplifiers, in that they start, take some initial thing, then they produce reproducible randomness after that. So the big con, really, for using, for using Pi, it's just, it's really expensive to compute. It's like, it's, you, it's, not, it's not a cheap to compute thing. And so the actual, the actual issue with, with practical random number generation is, Doing it in a practical way, doing it in as little space and as little time, and still producing <coughs> good, good results, things that satisfy all those statistical tests. So that's our sort of our, our goal. And what we're going to do um, to kind of explore this a little bit is we're actually going to invent a really terrible random number generator. So this is actually the multiply by three random number generator, which I hope you have a sinking feeling in your stomach about. <laughs> and so here it is. And um, and here's here's the output. And by the way, this is this this mo this, this 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 kind of random number generator has been around since um, 1951. Possibly not using three as the constant, but anyone have a criticism about this this um, sequence of random purportedly random numbers? Yes. A lot of odd numbers in that. Number. Okay, so not a lot of odd numbers. <laughs> there are no even numbers at all. Um, that seems. That seems like a, a problem, although we could always just divide by two or something and get rid of them. You cheated on your book because I'll bet that 9999 does occur, it just doesn't occur grouped correctly. So there are some numbers that don't, like, I don't know about 999, but I've, I've checked the thing. There are some, there are some that, that when, you, when you sequence them differently there. But that's like, we can, get, we can come to that questions at the end. So returning to the times three um, thing, we could actually say that they're all, they're all odd. And in fact, I was hoping that somebody would suggest that they are um, are all multiples of three, but actually that's not true because we get to the point where the thing starts to wrap around, and so the numbers I've colored in red are not are not multiples of three. So um, there is a way if you really don't like the fact that we're only getting the odd numbers, we can we can fix that um, by just multiplying by three and adding one. That will that will get the job done. Actually, there's something not very good about choosing. There's some some rules for these constants, and so. Well, actually, instead of multiplying by three and adding one, we'll multiply by one forty-one, which is a nicer number, and add three just to keep the three in there. And I've also reduced the size of things to, a, to an eight bit, so we have, we can see the whole thing. And so, if we if we look at that, that gives us the whole um, the whole sequence of of numbers. And so, this this has been 
um, this is our 1960s technology here, and every number appears exactly once, which is, which is a nice thing. Remember how we had that issue with bias in this book? Well, this, this is like a book where there is no bias. No matter where we start, the, the odds, because everything occurs once, we're good. We call that property uniformity. And so it's uniform. Um, it's also a bit weird that everything only appears once because you know, you'd expect there to be duplicates. But you know, with such a small thing, what can you expect, perhaps? Um, anyone notice any, other, any flaws with this? Like, I'm doing a small size, which is doing a small size one just because we can fit it, so I can fit it. I'm missing something. Are you doing this and then truncating it to three digits? What, what is this? I said it was, it's, an, it's, it's, an, it's an 8 bit integer that I'm oh, using, sorry. so it's wrapping in an 8 bit integer. Okay, so, good question, thank you. Parity alternates. Yeah, this is the parity alternates. It goes, it goes um, even odd, even odd, even odd, even odd. And so, that's, um, that you could be, you could be unhappy about about the fact that it's, it's producing even on. In fact, that's because the, the period of the low order bit is actually just, just it's just a, has two, as opposed to two things, like zero and one. The, the next bit has a period of double that, which is slightly better, and the period doubles as you go to each successive bit. But the low order bits are pretty awful. Um, so we could complain about that. There was something else, though, that, that got observed in, in 1968. Some of you may, may be familiar um, with this, that if you take the, these numbers, and you group them into pairs, and you use them as x and y coordinates, and you plot them, you, you get this very, very rigid structure. In fact, this is, this is purportedly a good sort of structure for one of these things, it's called a linear, this is called a linear congruential generator, and this is a purportedly good one because, although they're kind of, the, in two dimensional, in two dimensions they're actually reasonably well spaced, they're not all forming nasty lines, sort of stripey, stripey things, so, um, but they're still, you could say like, I think many of you would have a gut feeling looking at this and be like, that doesn't seem random to me. <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's sort of like, this, is a, this gets started out a lot as like the poster thing, the poster child for um, linear congruential generators. Like, they must be really awful. Look at this, it's terrible. And, but I want you to just to sort of not, not necessarily accept everything that people tell you because one thing is that we've taken a random number generator that can only produce 256 numbers. And then we've plotted it on a grid that has 65,000 points. And be like, oh, try to fill this space, would you, random number generator? And you can argue that it's like it's doing the best it can as a 256, uh, I think with 256 states. It's, it's I mean, you know, if it, if it did it more irregularly, there'd be gaps where stuff never occurs. And would that be, would that be better? Um, and so Knuth, when he, looks at, when he looked at these things, he called this the grain of linear congruential generator and said, well, that's, that's just, you know, you've zoomed in too far. And and you you know and we can also actually if you if you look at the order in which these things occur they actually occur in a in a kind of a fairly random order and so maybe you can feel a little bit better about this like you saw that this thing was awful but you know, yeah, maybe it's maybe it's actually better than you thought and in fact people continue to use these things even though people came up with other other things they and so here's a couple of really classic linear congruential generators following the two methods that we've seen. One is multiply by, by a number and add a small constant. And then what we've done is we've thrown order those, thrown away the, we've, we've done it at 48 bits and thrown away the low order 16 bits because they were really terrible, they had a really short period. And, and so the, and the other one is I'm just using multiplication, but I'm doing modulo some, some prime, which, which actually kind of scatters things around um, reasonably nicely. Um, so D round 48, so, so these, these things actually have names. This, this one is called D round 48 and the other one is called Minstead and they're actually quite, quite old. They, one of them comes from 1983. It was originally written for a PDP-11, a 16-bit machine. Some of you will be like, yay, 16-bit machines. And, and so it was kind of, 48 was like three 16-bit variables were used to make the 48-bit the um, random number generator. And Minstead came out a bit later. The Minstead is a bit interesting because it has a period that's n just shy of a power of two, which is actually kind of awkward if you're trying to generate random bits because it's like you're not quite matching up. It's like in a lot of computing applications, especially some systems-y ones, we want random bits. And so it's nicer to have 
things where our output is a 32 bits exactly. And DRAM48 can do that really nicely. Also, Minstead has the issue that every number only occurs once because the period and the output range are the same, whereas in DRAM48, every number occurs 65,000 times. And so we can, we can have, we're still not biased, we're still uniform. And, and you might think, well, this is great. You know, this is telling me about this stuff. It's from the, the 80s. I love the 80s, but, you know, how is this relevant to me today? Well, let me just point out that DRAM48 is Java Util Random, and um, the other one is C11's Minstead Rand. And both Clang and GCC use Minstead as their default random, random number generator. So even today, these are incredibly prevalent. It's also the case that Java has added some ones since this, but this, a lot of people still use Java Util Random. So given the flaws that we've seen, why, why are linear congruent generators so, so prevalent? Well, there are lots of, lots of good things about, about them. They can be quite fast. They can support multiple streams. The constant that we add, well, the ones where we add a constant, if you add a different odd constant, you actually get a completely different sequence of random numbers. And so that's kind of a cool property. We can scale them to arbitrary sizes. Um, they support some other cool things. Um, if you take the algorithm for fast and exponentiation, you can adapt that pretty trivially to do jump ahead. So you can say, oh, what number would I produce you know, a, million a million steps from now? And so they, they support um, lots of nice things. And because it's a simple linear rel relationship, mathematically, they're really well understood. And so that's a positive thing. But that, that grid still kind of like gets people in the gut. You know, it's like, yeah, I don't like that. And so we really have to be, be aware that they are statistically mediocre. And because of the fact that they, they follow a simple mathematical formula, they are predictable. The, the, you know, Minstead is obviously predictable. Its state is, is its output. Um, and even when you drop the, the low order 16 bits, it's trivial to figure out what those low order 16 bits are. With only 16 bits, you could just brute force it. And so it's worth thinking about some of the alternatives. There are tons of alternatives, but we're going to focus on the ones that are most well known and most popular today. So one of the ones that's really well known and, and really popular is the Merzen Twister. And it was a tour de force um, when it came out in 1997. And it has an absolutely massive period, which means that if you were hoping to use that technique of sort of memorizing the whole book and doing a search in it, it's not going to work for you. It's totally not going to work because like, this, is, this is vastly larger than the, in fact, I should talk about how large this period is. Because for this book, this is 200,000 integers. And I expressed it graphically. Um, on the screen. Well, what we're going to do is, is imagine, you know, we all have these little eye devices with these retina displays and, so, and stuff. So if I took that thing and I shrank it down to a retina display size, that, that 200,000 things numbers would fill a one and a half square inches on an iPad um, on a retina screen. If I had two to the 32 integers, that would be a generous faculty office. In fact, I checked in at Stanford, that would be, the, we could you know, tile the ceiling of a dean's office with, with iPad resolution things and express the whole random sequence there that way. And that would be that much, that much space. If I had two to the 48 integers, uh, all, of the, all of the numbers, if I laid them out on, a, on iPad resolution, that would fill 150 city blocks. If I went to two to the 64 integers, that would be the size of Maine or Portugal, um, or if you like, if you like think, think of things more mathematically, uh, the radius, a sphere with a radius 53 miles, the surface area of that. If we go up to 2 to the 128 integers, that is a sphere with a radius 900 astronomical units. That's, that's 10 times the, you know, the, the, the radius out to the, heliosphere, the end of the edge of the heliosphere, which is like, you know, so we're way encompassing the entire solar system. And I didn't put it on the slide, but if you do 2 to the 256, that would be a sphere that is, in the same way this is 10 times like our solar system, be 10 times the observable universe. So that's, that's a pretty huge period. And the Mosin Twister is way, way, way bigger than that. So an approach where you just search through the thing is, is completely impractical. So that might seem kind of cool. As I, as I think I said, it was like mathematically, it, was a, it had lots of, like this is a mostly systems audience, I can say to you, it's really scary math. You know? So, um, so that, seems, that seems kind of positive, but unfortunately, there were some, some issues. One is that it's, it's huge um, for a random number generator. It's like it takes two and a half kilobytes. 
And you might think, well, what's two and a half kilobytes? But if you wanted to embed a random number in your data structure, generate it in your data structures, you know, that's going to add up if you decide to use multiple, multiple random number generators. It's not that fast, actually. And really, really crazily, if you just, even despite the huge number of numbers it can produce, if you just get 624 numbers from the Mosin Twister, from that point onwards, you can predict it completely, which is really kind of sad. Um, so it also has some other, some other issues. And, and it's not the only random number generator that people can uh, The Mosin Twister was produced for Python, was, it gets used by Python and lots of other languages. But there are other people who've, who've picked other ones. And another popular one is one called ExorShift, which was produced by the same person that actually came up with the, that horrible diagram that showed how awful linear congruential generators were. Um, <laughs> It is a bit awkward that it has that minus one on the, on the period. It's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's a little bit annoying. It, it's incapable of producing zero, essentially. Like the zero state is its death state. It, it hates that. So, and other people produced other random numbers, but there are other, other, other random number generators. But things look pretty good. It's like, you could tell people, well, if you want something really big, use the Muzzin Twister, maybe. And if you want something a bit smaller, you could use XOR Shift. And things were looking pretty good in the world of random number generation until 2007. And in 2007, one of the, the leading lights in random number generation, somebody in Montreal called Pierre Lecuet, um, decided to, people have been coming up with statistical tests for random number generation for a long time, ever since you know, Tippett's book first came out. And in two, 2007, Pierre Lecuet took, uh, one, and he searched the literature and he found about 160 different random number tests, statistical tests that you could apply to a random number generator. And he developed, a, um, a test suite called Test U01. And the idea was it was a rigorous, a rigorous thing to, to put random number generators through to see how well they would do, how many of all of these statistical tests they would pass. And not surprisingly, uh, when you take a look at linear congruential generators, they, they did not pass. He did three different batteries, one called Small Crush that runs in about 10 seconds. And so small crush, in 10 seconds, we like run 15 tests, and some of the linear congruential generators just failed all 15, just went boom, failed everything. <laughs> and, um, and he also had two others, media, uh, crush and big crush. And big crush takes about six to eight hours to run and does much more, it's like a much more intense test. But, but these linear congruential generators couldn't even last 10 seconds of statistical scrutiny. It wasn't just linear congruential generators either. They, there were various other ones. A lot of people think that the Unix random generation scheme should be better than things like DRAN48. You can see here it's actually worse, fails more statistical tests. Um, XOR shift also fails, uh, at least in its 32-bit incarnation. So that's, that's pretty bad. And that's just the 10-second test. What about the one that runs for eight hours? Well, almost everything felt big crush. Like, certainly the ones that anyone, anyone ever used um, Failed big crush. There are some esoteric ones that are not necessarily practical. Like we could use pi. That would that would have passed. But um, but the um, but all the ones that people actually use, nope. They that was the, it was kind of decimated the the field, and that was kind of surprising because some people um, you know really love things like the Mosin Twister. They had all this beautiful mathematics and stuff. But unfortunately, mathematics can't capture all the properties that you might you might care about in a random number generator, and. And in particular, all of the techniques that are based on something called a generalized linear feedback shift register design, there's a test. There's actually a sniff test for this thing called a, for that kind of random number generator. Hmm, hmm, you smell like a linear feedback shift register. Mm. Yeah, I, I, know, I know your thing. And so that's, that is a test called um, linear complexity that, that performs that, that test. And that's part of the big crush suite. For some reason, it's not part of small crush, even though it actually doesn't take very long to run. So just because I'm a cruel person, I took that test out of, out of Big Crush and I was like, I'll just run that separately and see, see what it does with these, these ones. And it turns out that if you run the linear complexity test on a bunch of these, these ones that are you know, really well respected in the literature, they all, they all fail and they fail in about you know, six to 10 seconds. And for the Merzen Twister, you just need 45,000 random numbers from it and it's like, boom, sorry, you're, you're, you're no good. And of course you can react to that by just saying, oh, well, that test, I mean, Really, who would run that test? But you know, there, there's, it's still kind of a shame that these, these things failed this, failed this statistical test. So you could argue that that's kind of a shocker. But there's, there's even more of a shocker in this because remember how awful linear congruential generators were? Well, 
it turns out <laughs> that if you go up to a 64-bit linear congruent generator and throw away the low order 32 bits, that pass is small crush. And if you go up to 96 bits, that pass is big crush. And or to make a 96-bit one, it's not even hard. We could take that ancient code for DRAM48, just upgrade it to use 32-bit ints rather than 64-bit ints, and ta-da! You know, so it's like it's not hard to, to make a 96-bit linear congruent generator. So, and this is, this is something that's true for, for some of these generation schemes, that for many of them, more bits makes it easier for them to pass statistical tests, and fewer bits makes it harder. And you can kind of see sort of intuitively why that might be the case. If you, no matter how good a generator might be, if I crush it down to having a single bit of state, it's pretty clear that it couldn't pass very many statistical tests with only a single bit of state. And so it's, it's quite, it, it's kind of matches our intuition um, that having more bits might make it easier for things to pass. And it turns out that linear congruential generators actually pass at 88 bits. So if we throw away the low order 56 bits, keep the top 32, we, we actually will pass that big crush test. But it's not true, this property isn't true for everything. Sadly, XOR shift fails no matter how many bits you give it. And the Mosin twisted, despite how huge it was, it still fails. The, that, that sniff test doesn't care how big you are. It's like, no matter how big you are, it's like, no, oh, you're, you're a linear feedback shift register. So um, that's cool. Um, but 88 bits, you might think, well, maybe that's as good as you can get. But actually, if you, if you do some theory that's in the paper, I won't talk about it today. Um, you can actually determine that the, the smallest a thing could be, if it was uniform, the smallest it, and looking at the properties and how the statistical test works and so, and so forth, the smallest it could be, it's actually 36 bits. And 88 is quite a, quite, a big, quite a way away from 36 bits. And in fact, a variant of XOR shift, XOR shift star, passes Big Crush if we just keep, we do it at a 40 bit size and keep the top 32, throw away the bottom, the bottom um, eight. And you might say, well, what is, I mean, you don't even necessarily know what XO shift is, but what's XO shift star? Well, it's just XO shift plus an improving step. So what we're doing is we're doing something to, to, make, it, to make it a better, and, and what is this improving step? Well, crazily enough, what we do is we take the internal state and we multiply it by a number. And that's the improving step, step that XO shift star does. It's, it's actually taking the trick of a linear congruential generator and saying, I'll just apply that trick to get the, to get the job done. And... And so the state is, is still this, this shift register thing, but to get the output, it's doing this extra step. And this, this gives us a kind of a, something that's, that's a, a useful property about um, random number generation is like what the internal state is and what the output is don't have to be the same. We can tweak the internal state to, in producing the output. So what we did with DRAN48 is we had an internal state that was 48 bits. We threw away 16 bits and kept and kept the top 32. But you can also do scrambling. That's what XOR shift star does. And incidentally, that's what the Mersenne twister also does, although its scrambling doesn't stop it from failing the, the sniff test. And obviously, you could combine those um, together to make something that both drops bits and, um, and scrambles things. But no matter how we do this, we should make sure we don't introduce bias. So you might notice on the, on the um, we never have, it's always the case that it's always k to one. So the, in, these, in these examples, it's two to one, that two things, every, everything in the output has exactly two things that map to it. Um, other, if we did something different from, from that, we'd introduce, we'd introduce bias. So that's an idea that we don't, the output doesn't have to be the internal state. We can sort of permute it in some way. And there are three possible things that can happen if you permute the output. If the thing was already sort of truly random in some sense, it couldn't possibly change it. To, to put it through any kind of bijection wouldn't make it any less random than it already was. Um, but if you, if you have something that is not quite random enough and you put it through a suitable scrambling function, then that might make it seem more random. Uh, and that's what we did with ExoShift. And obviously, you could make it worse. In fact, if you'd already put it through that, that multiply and then you put it through this other one, that's the multiplicative inverse. And so that would turn ExoShift star back into ExoShift again. Um, but obviously, if we dropped some bits, then it might be harder to invert the, the, the transformation. But this leads to a fairly sort of obvious question, which is like, well, if, we, if we're allowed to do some stuff to improve XOR shift, surely I should be allowed to do some stuff to improve a linear concurrential generator. It's just only, only stands to reason. And so let's, let's see if we can come up with an idea here of what, of what to do. So we know 
we want 32 bits. We know the low order bits are, are terrible. Like the, the lowest order bit is just going 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, which is not, not very good at all. And, but they get better as you go further up. DRAM48 just threw away the, the, um, the low order 16 bits. We could just, for, with a 64 bit one, just throw away the, the bottom 32 bits. And we tried that, and that passed small crush, did not pass big crush. But here's, here's the idea. You could say, well, maybe the lowest ones are really terrible. And, and maybe in some sense, these top ones are sort of like the best. But these ones next door, they're not bad. They're not, they're not the worst random number generator numbers in the world. They, they're, they're kind of, they're pretty random. And the ones next to them, they're pretty random too. If we were using those, it would be not quite enough to pass all the statistical tests, but they'd be pretty good. These ones over here, not quite as good, but they're... And so I've got a bunch of different places I could choose some bits from. And so... Instead of just always picking from the same place, why not instead say, well, I've got a bunch of different random number generators sort of here in these bits. Let me, let me use, um, figure out some way to choose. And hmm, how should I choose? Hmm, what kind of algorithms do we like? I love randomized algorithms, so I should pick randomly. Hmm, okay. But where am I going to get any randomness from? If only I had some really good, high-quality randomness somewhere, that would really help me, right? Well, these are like the best, the, these top few bits are the best, best bits out there. So we could just take those three bits and say, I will pick uh, where to go based on those, those bits. So when these bits read two, I will pick the, this place here. I'll pick the, the point that's, that is... Let me, let me show you again. I'll show you again on a 16-bit example, just so that we can be clear what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, first of all, let's remind ourselves that, and I, this is actually for a terrible 16-bit linear congruential generator, so it's going to be really stripey. So if we plotted all the, the points that you get out of these, these top bits, it looks like that. If I went to the next one, it looks like that. If I went to the next one, it looks the same, still very stripey. The next one is kind of, I don't know if you can see on the projector, it's kind of dotty. And... The next one is, is even more dotty, and so on. And what we're going to do is, in this case, because it's only 16 bits, I'm just going to use the top two bits. And I'm going to pick, I'm going to use those to choose which of these four. Now, because I'm using the top two bits, it means that these, my very best two random number things are going to be out. So they're out of, out of the picture. But these top two bits are going to be causing me to switch. Depending on the value of the top two bits, I'll be switching between these, these other um, three things. And they, those are all terrible. And so the question is, what do you get if you randomly switch between them? What you get is that. Now, you might look at that and see, like, oh, I can still see some structure there. And you'd be right. There is still some structure there. But in terms of, like, at a gut level, does this feel more random to you than the individual things? I think you'd say, yeah, it's like those other ones were very, very, very regimented in their stripes, and this is this is this way of switching between things is seems seems at a, at a gut level like it might be better. And so the nice thing is the code for this is super simple. Because if we had a standard um, 64 bit linear congruential generator where you just dropped the load of 32 bits. We can just take that code or take this fixed shift of 32 bits and switch it down to just saying, well, I'll use the top, the top few bits to decide what my shift should be. And that's it. That's, that's the only difference in the, in the code. And the cool thing is that this thing passes big crush, and it does so at 58 bits, which is cool. So it means that you can have a 64, 64 bits of state produce 32 bit random numbers, and you're passing big crush with you know, six bits to spare, which is which is kind of, you know, like you could have, you could, which we can sort of gut level, we could say, well, I could double the size of the test and double it a few more times and I'd still be passing. Um, that's just one idea. Let's, let's consider some, another idea because you might remember, let's, let's say we're going to think about just this range, which is this, this little piece here on the, on the slides there. I'm actually just going to throw away those, those, bottom, those bottom few bits and pick and use the, the top bits to give me a number between 0 and 7. And so there, there is going to be my, my number. And I'm going to use that to pick, this time because I'm getting 8 bits out of 16, I'm going to use it to pick a rotation. 
Because it was always the case that the low order bit was like the, the worst one. I'm going to play for like, move it around. Where does it go? Nobody knows. Like that terrible bit is going to move around. And so I'm going to do rotations now. If you look at what it does to the lattice, it does horrible things because it's moving that low order bit up to high to make it really significant. It does really, really nasty things. But, and so none of these look very random or very nice at all. But if you combine them together, again, you get something that looks pretty cool. And What's neat about this is, again, this part is a big crush, but it does even better. It passes at 53 bits. But you still might be concerned. You might think, well, OK, this is all very neat, but how do you know you're not introducing bias or something, something strange here? And so let's think about that. So let's think about our, our process here that we were doing. We were taking a bit pattern. We're going to look at the first, um, the first, few, first three bits and we're going to use that to decide on a rotation. And so in this case, the rotation was two. And so we move the, the two bits around. And so that's where we're at at the, at the end. And the question is, how do we know that this, this transformation is a permutation? How do we know that it is a bijection? Um, and does anyone, does anyone have an argument for why, how you can know that this must be a bijection? That you can uh, by ejection means that we that we you know, one one way to tell with a permutation is that you can you can un you can undo it. It's a conditional permutation. So when when you say conditional permutation, you mean well, it's, it's it's driven by those, those it's driven by those those top those top bits. Because does anyone have an any, anyone have an, an argument for how you know that this this is this has to be a bijection? One one thing is that we can say that we can we can know it is if we can if we know we can undo it. Do you know that you can undo it? You could do it the other way. What's the re what's the recipe for doing that? <laughs> you just you just look at the top bits and do the reverse in the other direction, and then you're back where you started. So this is obviously invertible, and so we can look at this one and say I know that this this one is invertible, and we know that it's a bijection. But we can actually generalize this and just think about this in general. So we'd have a little bit. A little bit of math, there's more, if you love intimidating math, there's more in the paper, but um, the PCG paper. But what we're going to do is we're going to consider these, these two parts of the thing as a tuple, as a pair. And in general, I'm going to consider the top part and the bottom bit permutations on A cross B. So that's so we're just thinking of this, this thing as a, as a pair. Now, the most obvious permutation that you could do, bijection that you could do on a pair, is you take two permutation functions, one that turns, that permutes the A's, one that permutes the B's, and you just apply them both. And that would give you um, a permutation on, um, on them both. But that, that sort of is not what we were doing. What we were doing was something a little bit different. So what we did is we concentrated all our effort on one side. We said we had a family of permutations. In our case, we had a family of rotations. We had eight different rotations by zero, by one, by two, all the way up to seven. So we had a family of, of permutation functions. And every one of them is a, is a permutation. It can be inverted. And there's one for every, every member of, of A, our, the things on the one side of our tuple. And if we have that family, then it's also the case that if we apply, if we apply it by using this F star where we say, F star of AB is A, followed by F of A, F A of B, then that is a permutation for exactly the same reasoning that we had before, that you can undo it, that we can just apply the inverse of the permutation to, to undo it. And so that gives us a really powerful way to perform permutations using the randomness that already exists in, in, our, in our random bits. We can use the high order bits and use them to perform whatever permutation. We've picked some simple things. We picked um, things like um, rotations and, um, and shifts, but you can, do, you can do other things too. And that's kind of a neat, a neat idea. And this, is, this idea of applying permutations in general, and in particular these particular cool kinds of permutations, is what underlies this family that I produced, which is the PCG family, which stands for permuted linear concurrential generator. And so in the PCG family, we just start with the base linear concurrential generator because it has lots of cool properties, all the things like jump ahead, compact size, etc. Almost all pretty good. And then we just add that little extra magic of some permutation stuff on the end. Potentially, 
with that permutation, we're also dropping some stuff, dropping some bits, which means that the permutation can actually be hard to, in, we're going to get a K to 1 transformation that's hard to invert because you, you don't know what the, what the bits you lost were. So that's what, that's what happens with the PCG, PCG family. You could, begin, you could just do a random shift or a random rotate. That get, gives you some stuff, but we can combine them. We can stack one, one permutation atop another and do even better. So that's the sort of theory, but what about the practice? How, how well do these things actually perform in practice? Well, we're going to begin by thinking about predictable 32-bit generators. Now, for everything in this, on this thing, except for the Mersenne twister, only has 32 bits of state, just four bytes of state, tiny, tiny amount of state, and we're asking it to produce 32 bits of output. So it cannot hide anything, it can't throw anything away. By definition, you have to be able to, all of its permutations must be invertible, you can get back to the state and thus you can predict them. So they are going to be predictable, um, and they're going to be small. So how, how do these do? Well, in terms of speed, you can see there that um, this is in gigabits per second, and the PCG, the P, this, this particular PCG one, which stacks three permutations together, is actually um, would happily saturate 30 gigabit Ethernet lines, which is kind of cool, 30 gigabits um, per second, which is, which is pretty neat. And what about statistical quality? Because that's something else we said we, we should care about. Um, well, these ones on the, on the right-hand side, um, they, they fail small crush. And the ones on the right-hand side, they pass small crush. Um, which is which is cool. Remember, it's a tiny, tiny generator. So we already said that you couldn't possibly pass Big Crush without with fewer than thirty-six bits. So we can't expect we can't expect um, the the a thirty-two bit generator to pass Big Crush, but it does pass Small Crush, which is good. And so does the Mosin Twister. It's much huger. It doesn't pass Big Crush either, but for no no good reason really. Um, so that's that's a. I think. What, we might say, well, what about Big Crush, though? How big do you have to get to pass Big Crush? Well, we know, we know that the Mosin Twister doesn't pass Big Crush. We know that even though you can change the size of XL Shift, no matter how big we make it, it, it never passes that, that, that test. We know that XL Shift, we said that that actually did pass. If I keep the top 32 bits, throw away the low 8 bits, that passes. So what of what the PCG generator? How does that how does that do? Well, that one passes at 36 bits, which is really, really cool. And so that's so we've got something that's both fast and statistically really, really good. And so that's that's kind of cool. Unfortunately, though, this this one because it returns all of its state is well the the, the 32 bit one, not the 36 bit one, is returning all of its state. That's predictable. Um, I should also show you how. Minstead does, because it's kind of fascinating. Minstead is just a linear congruential generator. And so you might feel, be like, oh, wait a minute, I know it wouldn't pass statistical tests, but surely it should be faster because it's not doing these permutation things that the PCG ones are doing. So how on earth could PCG be faster than the, the linear congruential generator? That doesn't make any sense. Well, the, the answer to that is Minstead actually includes a modulus by a prime in it, and that means that we're doing a division operation, and that's slow. And so we could do all these permutations in the time that it takes easily, in less time that it takes to do the division. Yes. What's your expectation language? And this is in, in C, in C++. And I could, like, people have implemented them in uh, other languages, but yes, uh, this is, um, we'd, hope, we'd hope that these would be, would be fast. If you go up to 64-bit predictable generators, again, we're giving all 64 bits as our, of our output, you might, again, you can, you can see that the graphs look almost identical, across these things. And XL shift, we know that's going to fail statistical tests. We also know that the Mersenne twister fails statistical tests as well. Um, but you might be surprised, given everything we just said previously about it passing at 40 bits, that XL shift star fails at 64 bits as well. That's because I'm using 64 bits of state and I'm asking for it to give me all 64 bits of its state. And those lower order bits in XL shift star are still not very good. So it, it you can't you can't just return you can't just return those. So um, if we go if we go to a point where we start dropping some bits, this isn't a harder to predict ones. It's the last last slide of, of performance stuff. You can um, 
you can see here that the um, XO shift is again not doing very well in terms of performance, either, either it's speed or it's, um, it's statistical goodness. And these other, these other ones are, are doing a bit better. They, these are all past statistical tests. Um, I've added a new one onto the, onto the list here. I've added arc for a random, which is its whole reason for being is to be hard to predict. It's a, it's a cryptographically secure random number generator. And so it works really, really hard to do lots and lots and lots of scrambling to be really sure that nobody could possibly back, back the thing out. Of course, all that amount of scrambling that it does makes it really, really much, much slower than everything else. And it's not clear that you need to do that much, even though like, I wouldn't say that, that, this, that the PCG one that's hard to predict is the, is the most hard to predict PCG one. There are ones that are quite hard to predict that don't try nearly as hard as arc random does. But if you're doing cryptography, maybe you want to over-engineer things a bit. Also, arc random is kind of old. There's, there's a new one called ChaCha20 that people quite like, and that runs about twice as fast as arc random. So that's good for a cryptographically secure generator that people are happy with, but um, it's still kind, of, still kind of slow. And actually, the statistical properties of those ones are not as well understood as some of the other ones. So that's a little bit about the performance of things. And if you want to know more about things, you can go to pcgrandom.org. There is a paper, there is code, and most importantly, there, is part, there are party tricks. In, one of the things I haven't talked about at all is an extension technique using the permutation stuff that allows you to extend the period pretty much arbitrarily on a, on a base generator. And so we can go to, if you love really, really huge generators that have massive, numbers, massive bits of state, um, you, can, you can totally have that. And there's a property called k-dimensional equidistribution, which means that every k-tuple occurs the same number of times. You can have that too. And with that, you can actually have crazy things like generators that have insanely huge periods, but also um, you can set them up so that they're just on the verge of spitting out a zip file that contains Shakespeare, which is kind of a crazy, a crazy thing to do. It's kind of fun. Um, and I'm going to finish up as my last thing to do. So we did fun stuff with permutations. We, you might remember we had those awful drawings that made linear congruential generators look bad. I thought it would be only fair to try to make my stuff look bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to improve about the worst possible random number generator you could possibly imagine by applying one of these permutations. So this is the add one 16-bit random number generator. I think you'd agree that this is not very random to start with. And this is horribly mean to my permutation techniques because they, they, they expect the top bits to be the most random. They're the, they're the least random when you're adding one. They hardly ever change. And so this is really horrible. Um, so what does it look like? Well, that, that's what it looks like. I think it's, I think it's kind, of, kind of fun. So that was, and if we go to a slightly different number, this is adding three. That's, that's what that looks like. And if we go to um, adding five, that's what that looks like. That was, that was the one where it's doing a, a random rotation. Um, and it's kind, of, it's kind of cute. It looks pretty fractal. The, there was that other one that could pass at 36 bits. Well, if I take the one where we add five, it's going to look a little bit better, but it's still, we're still being really mean to it because it's expecting the top bits to be the most random. They're totally not. And so it's kind of got a bit of to it. It still looks pretty awful. But if we just take the thing and instead of adding five, add a number that's actually going to change the high order bits, um, that permutation gives you an idea of how powerful the permit, that permutation is. That if we just we're not really using a proper linear congruential generator, we're just adding a constant, but it still looks pretty good. It looks pretty random, and so these things sort of remind me. You know, that's random stuff and art, and that's pretty much where we began the talk. That seems like a good place to end it. So I'll just ask if there are any questions. Yes. Yeah, so when you use, um, like, split into two parts and then use A to generate, like, FA um, to commute B, mm -hmm. like, I wonder why, like, stop at two, like, can you use FA of B to be a seed for the next part, too? So like, can you say, can you say it again? Yeah, can you go back to slide when you have, like, A and B? Sure. So you want to iteratively uh, apply the rotation? Right. Yeah. Or some other permutation. Oh, yeah. Would that increase, like, randomness, or...? So... If you, so you're saying... Use the output of the permutation to do some other permutation in the same way that you use. Yeah, so you can, so you can talk, I mean, the thing is you can stack these up, right? So, so you, one of the things that you can do is that you can, 
you can, I mean, you can use one thing to, to change the, you can, you can use the left-hand side to change the right-hand side, and then you can, having changed the right-hand side, you can change the right-hand, use the right-hand side, change the left-hand side, and so on. In fact, there's a sort of, um, a thing a bit like that, which, this might go by too quick for people to follow, but um, there's a thing that people say, like, how many bits of randomness do you need to shuffle a deck of cards? Um, and they might say, well, I must need 50, 52 factorial sort of stuff to do 50, 52 factorial because that's how many permutations there are. The correct answer, uh, or a different answer, is, is none at all um, because you have a deck of cards. <laughs> and the state of the deck of cards uh, represents things. And so you can use PCG <laughs> permutations to say, I'll, I'll use the front, I'll consider the front and the back of the cards. I'll look at the state of the front. I'll use that to permute the back. Then I'll use the state of the back to permute the front. Then I'll use the state of the edges to permute the middle. And then I'll use the state of the middle to permute the edges. And that means that I can, given a particular configuration, I can shuffle the cut deck in a unique way that's unique to that configuration. And that doesn't guarantee you that you'll go through all possible permutations. There's an extra trick that you can do on the top of that because this, you can invert it. So you can actually you can count through every possible permutation in a very regular way. But as you do that, you count through in a regular way, then you, you permute it in a unique way to some crazy combination, then you permute it back, count it, advance it one, and you can, so you can advance in a crazy way through all possible permutations in a deck of cards by doing that stacked, that idea of stacking permutations one on top of the other. So, so yes, and in fact, you know, that's, that's a good thing to do. The one thing that you can't do is that you can't, you can't futz with A on the, when, you're, when you're applying it. So you have to wait until you're done with that, with that step because you can't do anything that will prevent you from inverting it. So you can't mess with A um, in that step. OK, another question. Yes? Um, all the people I've heard talk about random numbers talk about the infinite stream and its statistical properties. <coughs> but they're, often, you don't want the, the whole stream. You want a very small subset, because you're asking a simple thing. And many years ago, I was working on the Unix Fortune program, which reads a file, stop the bottom, and chooses a random line on it. And I noticed that. Regularly, it was in my login script, I would see the same handful of fortunes over and over again. And I tracked this down to a fundamental problem with seeding the random number generator because the seeding process um, was, was just not able to find a random place in this <coughs> actually fit stream. And we've tried everything we could think of, and there were amazing spikes. I mean, you're supposed to get a Poisson distribution for the pieces you get out, but there were spikes out here like this. And the only way to get them to come down at all was after you seed to run for a million or two million iterations and see if you can get somewhere. But it was totally empirical. And I've, I've never had anyone actually try to investigate the problem of seeding generally. So the thing is, the, the seeding, people have investigated the, the, the question of seeding. We sort of like elided it because we said, you know, people were doing seeding back, back in the day when they had these, these books. And so we sort of didn't spend a lot of time thinking about um, how you do seeding. But there are ways, there are ways to, to get decent entropy, and I would love, I would love, I could give, I could give a whole separate, different talk on how. If you want, this is this is about deterministic generation, and there are there are ways. And I'm happy to chat to you afterwards, but there are some ways to guarantee, and some. So I'm actually surprised. I'm actually going to tease people with it, just because I can tease people with the thing that I can. I can actually show you a program that takes no input at all, and produces a different value every time you run it that is actually statistically random. And, the, and, when, I, and when, I, when I show that to people, it's always, an, always a really interesting conversation because I, they're like, oh, cool, OK. So does it, does it look at the time then? And I'm like, no, it takes no input. And they're like, oh, OK, cool. So does it go out on the web? Like, no, it takes no input. And they're like, mm. because people's understanding of how computers work doesn't, doesn't allow the idea um, that, that this is this could be possible. So some of you might know how how it's done, but um, I'm just going to leave that as a teaser for <laughs> for people. Um, it is it is a thing that you can you can you can write such a program. Um, but yeah, seeding seeding is an interesting is an interesting thing. One of the things actually in the in the practical side of the PCG generation scheme is it has some things to actually help you seed things well. It has um, things to help you do seeding well using things like the random device to make it really, really easy to do, to use that. It also has stuff where it can leverage, um, it has something called PCG Unique, where 
depending on where the, the generator is located in memory, it chooses a different stream. And if you use PCG Unique on a machine that has address space layout randomization, actually PCG Unique will give you different numbers every time as well. So um, it's, it, it, is, it is an important issue, and, and doing it well is something that it's much nicer if the libraries that you use just have stuff that takes care of it for you. And one of the big problems with a lot of random number stuff is that people don't, don't get those. those um, they're just like, oh, just come up with a seed. And, and some people do it well. And some people are like, oh, just use the time or whatever it is. And it's like, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily produce good results. Good question. You More questions, yes. Are you going to tell us how that works? Um, no input program. I'll tell, I'll talk to people. I'll, I'll tell people after, after, afterwards, like in the non, in the non-video part of the talk. Um, people, people, what's the camera? Like, so I'm terrible. There it is. Uh, so people are watching on video. Ha! Huh. So uh, should have been here. Um, so it is a kind of a known thing. But, um, yes. I tend to think uh, I'm one of these people that's gone after a lot of super randomness, and so I've used nuclear decay as one, and I've used thermal noise as the other. But I found out that the hardware I use is not random. Right. right. So the, I mean, the thing is, this is this is one of the things. One of the reasons why people came out with these books originally is that you might think that the, the physical world would be great for producing randomness, but it's actually it's actually really bad at producing sort of statistical randomness. There can be problems with the hardware and so forth, and it's. Um, you know, if you get people to roll die, a die, it's going to be, they can introduce bias, surprisingly. And, um, and it turns out that it's not, you know, it, 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 it's, not, it's not sort of better. The, the other funny thing is, of course, you know, the, if you look at how much, universally, how much randomness the universe can possibly produce, it's less than, the, than these random number generators we, we look at. So um, that's also kind of like a wacky, a wacky thing. Transistors are not random, therefore gates are not random, therefore computers are not random. Well, the thing is, the, that, gets, that gets to the definition of what, what we mean by random. And if you get to the point where you say, if you say it's random if we, if we can have things that are match the statistics and without some kind of omniscient view, we can't predict what they're going to do. I think we'd all agree that computers actually are pretty random in that sense. We can, we can like... A lot of a lot of debugging is is comes, <laughs> you know is, is just like trying to figure out what on earth it's doing, and some of those things can be can be quite challenging. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts on the use of methods like this, particularly in parallel applications, where you might have many different uh, sequences of generators acting. Um, right. So, so one of the things that you might want in a parallel. It, in a parallel situation is you might want to have, it doesn't make sense to have a global random number generator in a parallel system because it's going to become a bottleneck. And so that's one of the things that's a big issue for things like the Mosin Twister because it's like, if you just had one global one, maybe two and a half K of states, like, ah, oh, that's fine, whatever. But if you, if you want to have every, every thread have its own random number generator, then you, you probably want, that's, that's the thing to want. You also probably want that there couldn't be bizarre coincidences where one thread happens to use a similar seed to another one, and then they both happen to be producing the same purportedly random numbers, unless you want reproducibility, if you want them to have separate things. And so that's the idea that we mentioned sort of very briefly of random number streams. And so that's a property that linear congruential generators have, that if you use a different additive constant, you get a different stream, a completely different sequence of random numbers. They're still, if you put them on a grid, it would still look almost identical, but it is a different, it is a different sequence. And things built on the new concurrential generators get that same property. And in fact, what PCG Unique does is it uses the memory address of the state to, to say, OK, I'll use that to work out what my additive constant is. And so every memory address, is, every, every memory address becomes its own state. And so you can trivially give every, every thread a different sequence without any, without any trouble at all. And so that's, that's kind of a neat a neat thing for if you're if you're working in, in parallel. Yes. Sure. Any comments about the randomness on the uh, Intel CPUs? The, the the interesting thing is that they use they they're supposed to be coming out with an actual thing that uses transistor based noise, but that isn't what's in there right now. The ones that are in the Intel CPUs right now is it's actually using a an, an algorithm that and it's just saying you can't see the state. But the thing that's kind of sad is if you call RDRAND, it's way slower than, than running 
many of these, you know, including the, not just the PCG, but but other other things. It's not. It's essentially falling back to doing stuff that's implemented in microcode, and it's not it's not fast at all. And so, it's it's kind of a bizarre thing that you have an instruction called RD rand that is like produce a random number, and you think, well, that's a processor instruction. It should be fast, but it's like he, these these other random number generators can produce like PCG can generate um, a random number in less than a nanosecond, and so that's that's really. A, it's really cool that, that you know it can do like a multiply and add and and some shifts and stuff in, in so little time and and it's kind of sad that like this microcoded instruction can't beat that but presumably the, the intent was not to optimize. That sounds not like to optimize, a good seed. So it could be you could use RD rand as a seed, yeah. And you can use you can use other things. You can use you, you can use RD rand. You can use the timestamp counter. You can you can use a bunch of things to that are probably you know fairly fairly random, but there are... And I, and by the way, the other thing, I was not talking about the time stamp counter. Yes? Can, can you motivate um, me with an application that actually benefited uh, in a noticeable manner by using PCG? So, um, anything where, like, for any application, the, the question is, is random number generation going to be your bottleneck? So for some things, it's absolutely not. It's absolutely not a bottleneck at all. But suppose, for example, you want to pick something really simple like quicksort. Um, one of the one variation of quicksort is quicksort is a randomized algorithm where you choose the pivot at a, at a random point. And so you can use that that variant of um, of PCG, but sorry of of, of quicksort. <coughs> but whether you would use it or not depends on how fast you generate random numbers. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you if it takes you a long time, you'd be better off with some other non-randomized strategy. So whether a randomized algorithm is viable at all can depend on the speed of, of your random number generator. And so fast ones are, are are net positive. And so in that, so that's an example where whether a randomized quicksort is faster is, is worth using at all depends on how fast your random number generator is. And Obviously, it's also the case that if you go, if you if you have something where random number generation is not really the bottleneck, whether your thing takes one and a half nanoseconds or half a nanosecond might make no difference at all. And so that's that's an area where it might not be better to be to be faster. The cool thing about the PCG family is that it gives pretty much no matter what you want, it's there for you. So it's if you want fast, it is actually really fast. If you want statistic, statistically good, it's really statistically good. If you want compact, it's actually really compact. And if you, for some reason, you really love those gigantic uh, periods and k-dimensional equal distribution, we can go, we've got you covered there too. And if you want unpredictability, we've got some really, ones that are really hard to predict um, because, because of the way they permute things and drop some of the bits, making the permutation really hard to undo. So it's not is not easy to predict, unlike many of these these other ones. So if you don't, if you want hard to predict, fast, small, big, and um, statistically good, got you covered on all of those. And so that's that that is that is why a number of people are quite excited about it. Any other any other questions? Yes. So as a permutation, you kind of use say a crypto block with the. AES instructions on the Intel. Do you use which instructions? Like the AES instructions that. So you, I mean, the, the, right. that's that's another option, right? I mean, in in the um, because they've thrown a bunch of hardware at doing AES, you can you could say, well, if I've got really fast AES permutations, I could use those. I could use those too. One of the one of the things is that the the fundamental idea in PCG is just saying, well, use a simple simple generator. Um, that has some really nice properties, and then add permutations on the top. Here's, here are some good permutations, but it's not saying that, that those are the only ones that you can that you can use. And so, if you have a thing that does AES permutations really, really fast, then that could be a good solution. But the thing is, the AES permutations are designed to be really like like kind of like overkill to make it impossible that anyone could sort of figure out what happened to the to the bits because they kind of go around in crazy ways. And so. It's even though there's hardware implementations that make it make it fast. Part of the point 
of, of PCGs. It's trying to do, trying to get good randomness with as little work as possible. There's not, there's not a lot to be said for, for having something that does more work. You know, you can do things that are more work than you need, but why do more work than you need? You're, you're, we're trying to get as, as much bang for buck in a sense there. 